Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Spring 2019 Seminar in American Religion. My name is Kathleen Sprose Cummings. I'm the director of the Kushwa Center for the Study of American Catholicism and a faculty member here in the Departments of American Studies and History. It's wonderful to see so many familiar faces, as well as a few new ones joining us for the first time, and I want to extend a particularly warm welcome, if that's the case for you. Twice each year since 1980, the Seminar in American Religion provides historians of North American religion and other interested scholars an opportunity to discuss a recent notable book published in the field. The topic of our seminar today is Catherine O'Donnell's book, Elizabeth Seton, American Saint, published last year by Cornell University Press. It's my pleasure to introduce our panelists for this morning, beginning with our author. Catherine O'Donnell is Associate Professor of History at Arizona State University. She received her PhD in history from the University of Michigan. After completing her dissertation, she spent two years as a fellow at the Amahundro Institute of Early American History and Culture and as a visiting assistant professor of history at the College of, Women, of, of William and Mary. She is the author of Men of Letters in the Early Republic, Cultivating Forms of Citizenship, that was published by UNC Press in 2008. And she has published articles in the journal Early American Literature, the William and Mary Quarterly, the Journal of the Early Republic, and US Catholic Historian. Catherine's work examines intersections of citizenship, religious belief, and intellectual and political history in the early American Republic, and uh, with a particular focus now on Catholicism in the United States. Uh, it's wonderful, this has happened just a, a few times before in my uh, tenure at the Kushwa Center, where you meet a person when they come to Notre Dame for the first time on a research travel grant, and uh, then later you're able to feature the book for the Seminar in American Religion, and that is the case uh, with Catherine. I've been a close admirer of her work for a long time, and uh, indeed, she was awarded one of the Kushwa Center's research travel grants in 2008, and it was on the occasion of that research that we first started to talk about this book. Her first book was just being published then, and she was turning to new research on Bishop John Carroll as well as Elizabeth Ann Seton, and thought there just might be a book project um, in this. <laughs> And then about midway through the project, a few years later, the Kushwa Center hosted a two-week seminar in Rome, Italy, the purpose of which was to bring together junior and senior scholars to explore transatlantic perspectives on US Catholic history. And Catherine led one of our sessions titled The Life of Elizabeth Ann Seton in Transatlantic Perspective, where she explained how crucial Roman archival sources were to <coughs> framing her research. Then in March 2017, Catherine gave another talk here at at Notre Dame, um, on the main campus of Notre Dame, this time sponsored by the Hesburgh Libraries. And I know Jean McManus and Rachel Bowman, who organized that, are here this morning. Um, this talk was on the reading life of Elizabeth Seton, and that accompanied an exhibit hosted by rare books and special collections that was titled Preserving the Steadfastness of Your Faith, Catholics in the Early American Republic which featured artifacts and texts from Seton's life. And they were all engaging, very engaging sessions. So Catherine, we're delighted and have been very much looking forward to having you back with us today. We're fortunate to have two excellent commentators to get our discussion started this morning, Jake Lundberg and Maggie McGinnis. Jake is my colleague uh, in the history department here at Notre Dame. He specializes in 19th century American history. He received his PhD from Yale University. And before uh, joining Notre Dame's faculty in 2016, he worked as assistant professor at Sacred Heart University and um, at Lake Forest College as well. His research focuses on 19th century US cultural and intellectual history, particularly the history of media and journalism. And he has just finished, I believe is in the copy editing, copy editing stage, of a new book titled Horace Greeley. Let's see, Print, Politics, and the Failure of American Nationhood. Did I get that right? It's a breaking news title, so um, just, just been announced. And it traces the career of Horace Greeley, the editor of the New York Tribune, and one of the 19th century's most confounding characters. The book tells a larger story about the problems of American nationalism and the limits of print communication in the Civil War era. So Jake, we're delighted that you could be with, uh, here with us today. Finally, I'm pleased to welcome, ah, thank you, I knew something was, <laughs> knew something wasn't sounding quite right. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome Maggie McGinnis uh, back to campus today, a professor of religion at LaSalle University. Um, 
her research interests include US Catholicism, the history of women religious, and religion and social justice. She received her PhD from Union Theological Seminary. Began her teaching career at Cabrini College in Radnor, Pennsylvania, an institution named for another American first, in, uh, but she uh, moved to LaSalle University in 2006, where she served as chair of the religion department until 2001. Maggie is the author of Neighbors and Missionaries, a history of the Sisters of Our Lady of Christian Doctrine, published by Fordham University Press in 2012, and of Called to Serve, a history of nuns in America, published by New York University Press in 2013. Called to Serve won the 2014 Catholic Book Award in History from the Catholic Press Association, and also the Conference on the History of Women Religious Distinguished Book Award Prize. With James Fisher, Maggie has co-edited two books, The Catholic Studies Reader, published in 2011, and Roman Catholicism in the United States, a thematic history published just last February. She serves as Associate Editor of American Catholic Studies, and in 2013 served as the President of the American Catholic Historical Association. Maggie is a longtime friend of the Kushwa Center. She gave a paper in our working series, I think in the late 80s sometimes. So again, one of those that you see a project developing over the years. I think that became, was that the Sisters of Christian yeah. Doctrine? or Yeah, OK, amazing. Um, she's a great ally to, to me um, on the steering committee of the Conference on the History of Women Religious, um, an organization that was founded in 1988 that began, with, uh, began its formal association with Kushwa in 2011. Um, Maggie will join us again on campus for next week's Kushwa Center Conference, Global History and Catholicism, where she is chairing one of our sessions. So thank you for being such a trooper and uh, <laughs> coming back to the Midwest uh, two weekends in a row. Now, for those of you who are new to our seminar, I'll just give a quick note on our format. We'll hear from each of our commentators first, and then we'll give Catherine an opportunity to respond to those comments briefly. Um, we'll take a short break and reconvene and open the floor to a general discussion. So thank you all for being here, and please join me in welcoming our first commentator, Jake Lumber. Well, thank you to um, Kathy for inviting me to do this, and, and thank you especially to Professor O'Donnell for this brilliant piece of historical scholarship and, and biographical writing. Um, it's certainly a great honor to be here. Um, and I'll also say straight away that it's, it's certainly quite daunting to be here. Uh, by way of disclaimer, I'll just remind this gathering of historians of American religion and Catholicism that I am not one of you. Um, <laughs> I am not a historian of American religion and Catholicism. And so, it is with some measure of apprehension that I should even dare to weigh in on a figure um, as big and, and as important as Elizabeth Seton, given, given this fact. Now, I will note, however, that I am available for uh, seminars in Rome. Um, <laughs> if, anybody, uh, if anybody needs me, uh, I'm happy to go. Um, as Kathy mentioned uh, in her introduction, I've just finished up this book about Horace Greeley, uh, the founder and editor of the New York Tribune. Uh, a figure who was different in just about every way possible from <laughs> Elizabeth Seton, um, where, where Seton was defined by a certain dignified private humility, particularly before her God. Uh, Greeley was defined by a very determined, very public self-aggrandizement. Um, if he had severely Protestant attitudes toward work, um, he wasn't terribly troubled by severely Protestant ideas of an angry God. Um, as one contemporary noted, he was a self-made man who worshipped his own creator. Um, and in, in, in religious terms, he described himself as, as little better than a universalist. Now, if Horace Greeley and Elizabeth Seton would not have seen eye to eye, and I don't think they would have, um, I'd like to use my own experiences researching and writing about him as an entry point into my reflections on this terrific book. Um, specifically, I'd like to think about Elizabeth Seton, American Saint, in light of the peculiar challenges and problems that historians face when they become biographers. Uh, biography, it is no secret, is a much maligned, often unloved branch of historical writing and scholarship, even if historians seem to write a lot of them um, and win a lot of prizes for them when they do. Uh, just this year, uh, David Blight won the Bancroft Prize for a biography of, of Frederick Douglass. 
but nonetheless, I think some of the stigma remains. Um, the Chronicle Review back in 2008 ran a piece called Biography, the Bastard Child of Academe. Uh, the following year, David Nassau was somewhat gentler in the American Historical Review. He called biography the historical profession's unloved stepchild, occasionally but grudgingly let in the door, more often shut outside with the riffraff. Um, and th there are some, some good reasons for these attitudes, uh, reasons that go beyond the fact that 87% of all biographies are about Winston Churchill uh, <laughs> and written by non-academic historians. Please don't cite that statistic. I made that up. Um, um, well, the problems of biography um, begin, the problems of biography as history begin in the history of biography. Uh, going back a long, long way, the animating impulses of biography have been inspirational, devotional, didactic, uh, but not rigidly historical. Um, this may make for good life lessons. Many Americans surely learned something about honesty from the story of George Washington and his father's cherry tree, but it doesn't always make good history. Uh, Parson Weems made, made, that, made that story up. Um, but if you want to be more rigorous and more scholarly in your approach, there's the problem of how far a single person can be taxed to yield historical meaning. If the historian's mandate is to intervene in a literature, how do you do that going in with just a single person, even if that single person is as manifestly uh, capital I important as Thomas Jefferson or Eleanor Roosevelt or, or, uh, or Elizabeth Seton? Um, and how do you answer the, the so what question? Uh, the debates surrounding these individuals are often sort of eddies swirling on the edge of a larger stream, and it's unclear how much energy uh, you should spend uh, swimming within them. At the same time, uh, as you use your subject to make broader contextual claims, you're climbing out onto a narrowing limb. Uh, a single person can only get you so far. Next is the problem of how well you can actually know a long departed historical individual. How accurately can you reconstruct a self with nothing but the written traces of that self in an archive? Are you writing history or are you writing historical fiction? This is a problem if you're dealing with someone uh, with a limited and opaque historical record like Martha Ballard, uh, the midwife in Maine who left behind an extensive but not terribly revealing diary. Uh, and it's a problem if you're dealing with a public figure who is keenly aware that he or she might someday become the subject of a biography like Thomas Jefferson. And there are a host of other issues, which I'll just mention in passing. What happens when the biographer comes to love or hate their subject? Uh, what right does a biographer have to make a private life public? Uh, what happens when the biographer clashes with cherished memories of ancestors or dearly held notions of the public? Uh, the, list, the list goes on. So it, 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 is, it is into these difficult waters that historians venture when they begin biographical project, projects that the particular habit, hazards uh, defined by the idiosyncrasies of their subjects. Now, for, from the outset of Elizabeth Seton, American Saint, Professor O'Donnell is quite direct about the challenges her subject presents. First, Elizabeth Seton is a living presence in the historical memory of American Catholics, uh, a figure who has done as much for the American branch of the faith in her afterlife as an American saint um, as she did in her own time as a historical individual. Uh, and of course, she is also a living presence within the communities of women religious that carry on her work. So to tell her story is to see her through the inevitable refractions produced by such uh, present and living legacies. Second, Elizabeth Seton was a person defi who defined and organized her experience through faith in her own lifetime. And as O'Donnell notes in her prologue, writing about faith as historians can be a very tricky proposition. And let me start with this, this second issue, the issue of treating faith historically, uh, before returning at the end to some questions raised by the, by the first. So how do we write about faith historically? Well, I'm, I'm sure there are uh, many good answers to that question um, out, out, out here in, in the group. Um, but on, on the one hand, there's always a temptation to understand faith as an instrumentality 
um, in the face of dramatic social, political, and economic change, things like modernization, political revolution, uh, the transition to capitalism. But on the other hand, take faith too much at face value and you run the risk of leaving historical context altogether and, in, and perhaps even leaving history altogether um, and moving into the realm of theology. Uh, by my reading, Elizabeth Seton, American Saint, deftly walks the line between these extremes. Indeed, I would say that the book is at its very finest in offering a richly textured historical account of an individual life in faith. This means an account that takes faith seriously on its own terms while recognizing the contextual forces uh, and factors shaping it. In her prologue, O'Donnell establishes a sort of golden mean for doing just that. Faith, she writes, is not reducible to the instrumental uses that historians commonly acknowledge as real. The maintenance of social order, the creation of allegiances, the fight against modernity's dislocations, nor, however, is faith abstracted from the societies in which it develops. Faith looks away from the world, but must be lived within it. But the framework for interpreting faith isn't the only problem. There's also the slippery nature of faith itself as a lived experience. Faith is not monolithic, not collectively for people within a faith, um, not for individual believers. And as we watch Seton struggle in her faith, watch her have her moments of transcendence along with her moments of doubt and darkness. We're also watching a faith, the Catholic faith, struggle to define itself in America through its own institutional disorder and weakness. I think I could point to just about any part of the book to illustrate how O'Donnell manages to create such a finely textured account of Elizabeth Seton's spiritual life but her treatment of, of Seton's conversion uh, really stood out to me as, as a model. The book moves so seamlessly between Seton's inner life and her, and her outer circumstances. This, of course, is made possible by the wonderfully rich correspondence combined with the commonplace books that allow us to know Elizabeth Seton as a reader. Uh, but O'Donnell is, is, is so skillful in using these sources to develop really a portrait of a mind uh, making sense of its circumstances and, and a wider world. The result is that we're able to move up and down between these different levels, beginning with Seton herself as a voracious reader, um, an intellectual, as a spiritual seeker. Um, one level up from that are the often trying circumstances of her family lives, first as a daughter in this somewhat broken home, then as a wife and mother um, in an economically precarious and medically unfortunate uh, merchant clan. Continuing to move upward and outward, we have the broader genteel social milieu of an urban elite, uh, the dislocations of a post-revolutionary society, the cross currents of a religious revival, um, and an outsider faith community trying to define its place in the United States. This is a potentially bewildering number of variables and strands to, to keep up with. Uh, but O'Donnell is able to establish Seton as such a clearly defined character with a collection of tools at her disposal for organizing her experience and finding meaning within all of these different, and th these different frames. And so when it comes time to understand her spiritual crisis and conversion, we're able to do so quite readily because we already know her mind we know her circumstances and we know her context. We can see Catholicism fitting within her existing ideas, answering open questions, um, and opening up new ones. <clears throat> and all of this unfolds before the reader um, very much in and on Seton's own terms. O'Donnell doesn't use a whole lot of language um, or concepts that would have been foreign to, to Elizabeth Seton herself. She doesn't psychologize her, as so many modern biographers are tempted to do with their subjects. Um, instead, O'Donnell gives us the conversion as Seton herself understood and articulated it. At the same time, the external contextual circumstances never fall away. O'Donnell argues convincingly to me, um, as someone generally on the outside of this literature, that this spiritual journey must be understood within the broader religious movements of the late 18th and early 19th century United States. 
Uh, Seton's conversion to Catholicism comes not as a radical cut against the grain of those movements, um, but very much, very much within it. Um, at first, to me, this seemed very counterintuitive based on everything we think about the foundational nature of Protestantism in the new nation um, and the anti-Catholicism that's just sort of baked into that. Uh, but as we see with Seton, knowing <coughs> the air that she's breathing, uh, the books that she's reading, the sermons she's been attending, this actually doesn't come as such a radical break. She is, as O'Donnell tells us, uh, an evangelical Protestant on a Catholic spiritual journey. And ultimately, a Catholic community in the mountains of Western Maryland is just as likely a place for her to end up under these cultural and religious circumstances as any other group, denomination, or experimental community. So yes, as, as Professor O'Donnell says um, at, the beginning of the, at, at the beginning of the book, faith is hard. Uh, writing about faith as a historian is hard. Uh, but I think the great achievement of this book is establishing this character, setting these circumstances, uh, letting them mingle together, and ultimately, if not making it look easy, um, at least making it all make sense. So uh, with, with that, I'd like to close by using this discussion as a place to ask Professor O'Donnell some questions. First, I'd, I'd like to start with some process questions related to your turn as a biographer. Um, how did you think through understanding and representing Seton as a person of faith? Uh, did you have a long process of figuring out how you were going to do this? Um, did you begin with certain preconceptions of how to think about her that then changed as you worked through the sources? Um, did you wind up in uh, unexpected places al along the way? Next, I I'm curious um, about how you thought about audience here. Um, it seems like concerns about audience are, are very much at the heart of historian hand-wringing over biography. Um, and I'm imagining that a couple of factors I've already mentioned, Seton's place in American Catholic memory, um, as well as the ongoing life of, of her religious order with, with whom uh, you, you, you interacted, um, could have complicated your relationship to, to audience here. And so was that a challenge? Um, and if so, uh, what was it like and how, how, did you, how did you work through that? Um, next, uh, I had a question about, about sources. I was curious um, throughout about the nature of, uh, of your archive writ large. Obviously, you had um, an incredibly rich base of sources to work with, but I wondered if there are ways in which it may have uh, been curated and shaped to point to a certain story uh, beginning during, really during Seton's own lifetime um, and continuing through the long multi-stage sainthood campaign um, after her death. And on a related note, I, I was curious about how conscious Seton herself was of her own historical importance and symbolism. Uh, to what extent did she see herself as Mother Seton, foundational figure in, in American Catholicism? Um, and with that, are there ways in which you can see her actively shaping her image uh, for, for, the, for the future? Um, people who found things are very, very often have one eye on the present um, and one eye on posterity, and this has to be figured into any interaction with, with, uh, with, with, the, with the sources. Some of this is very gendered and I think very specific to this, to this particular moment. I'm thinking of men like Jefferson and really any man of the founder generation who you almost feel like you can never quite trust um, because they are so, uh, they are so focused on, on the, their image um, uh, in future, for future generations. Um, I don't necessarily think that's the case with, 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 uh, with Seton, but um, are there moments where that, where that kind of breaks, where that breaks through? Um, it certainly seems like others in her life were, uh, were aware of her symbolic value, um, beginning really with the very prospect of her conversion. People are thinking about this um, as something that's potentially important. Um, there's also a moment when, um, when she and Simon Brute are going over some of her past writings. They're kind of shuddering at her youthful enthusiasm for, for Rousseau. Um, next, I, I had a question about class um, that sort of circles back to some of these problems of biography and how representative an individual life can be. Um, could you say that in a way, 
uh, Seton's social position made this whole journey possible. Um, yes, she, she came down in the world after her marriage and, her, and, her, and in her widow, widowhood, um, but she never really lost her, her social capital. Um, and this, is, this made John Carroll interested in her conversion, um, I think allowed her to, to interact with the, the Feliki clan in certain ways. Um, and I think it was also part of her ability to gain the backing of the Carroll family um, in, in Maryland. This is something that I've been sort of thinking about throughout the book um, that kind of took full form um, in a single moment in the, in the epilogue. Um, it was a comment from Charles Carroll, Carroll Harper um, where, where he says that he was going to, he, that he would miss her agreeable conversation. Um, this is a very 18th century kind of sentiment, agreeability, um, but one that I also kind of heard as, as being sort of class bound. Um, so, so I may be getting carried away with this, but how important is class to her story? And if it was potentially really important, are there ways in, in which it might alter um, the extent to which we can see Seton as broadly representative? Uh, and my last question is, um, how American and American how? Um, it seems like you tilt toward a story of Seton as an American. Um, this begins with the title, of course, but, I, but it goes beyond it. Um, I sense that her conversion story amidst the Second Great Awakening and within all of these impulses of American Protestantism was part of it. Um, I sensed also that kind of the rude conditions of, of Emmitsburg um, were, were also a part of her, her, her Americanness. Um, at the same time, there are so many influences in her life that reach beyond American borders, uh, beginning with the Feliki family, continuing with all of these French clerics who have a profound influence on her daily life as a Catholic and whom she, of course, influences as well. Um, you, you acknowledge all of this, but I had the sense that analytically and in your argument, the American side was doing a little bit more work. I also know from, from Kathy's new book uh, that the question of, of Seton's identity um, was sort of a tension in her historical memory um, and very much a complicating factor in her, in her sainthood case. Um, so in, in light of this, I felt that at times the story was more embedded in an, in an, in an Atlantic framework than an American one, um, and that Seton's American meanings were, were sort of put there by, by others. Um, so how did you think through this identity question? Um, and am I just being overly influenced by the title in thinking that, that, you're, that you're really making a case for her as American, American saint? Um, so with that, I'll, 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 I'll close. Thank you very much for such a terrific book, and thank you all. Good morning. Happy to be here with you this morning. Um, as I read Catherine O'Donnell's very fine, to, okay, very fine biography of Elizabeth Seton, a phrase that is often used to define social media relationships kept running through my head. It's complicated. <laughs> Dr. O'Donnell's superbly written narrative indicates to me, at least, that Seton's story is indeed complicated, and that in order to understand this American saint, one needs to pay attention to the many worlds in which she moved. Readers of this book understand quickly that Elizabeth Seton's story did not begin when she arrived in Emmitsburg to found what would become the Sisters of Charity of St. Joseph, who later become the Daughters of Charity. And it would be equally inaccurate to begin her story when she converted to Catholicism. As Dr. O'Donnell writes, before Elizabeth Ann Bailey Seton became a, quote, serenely pious figure, she was first a miserable adolescent, a thrilled young bride, a skeptic of organized religion, and a spiritual seeker who feared she might go catastrophically astray. The fact that Seton's life in Emmitsburg does not begin until page 251 of this book means that indeed more than half of the book is devoted to her life prior to becoming mother with a capital M. And it makes it clear that O'Donnell is concerned with detailing the many complexities surrounding the person who became a capital M mother while already a mother, lowercase m, to five children. <laughs> 
It becomes complicated very early in the story when Seton is placed within the context of her family. Born in 1774 in New York City, shortly before the United States declared its independence from Great Britain, Elizabeth Bailey and her family identified as Anglican turned Episcopalian, which is complicated in its own right, which was, of course, the result of the Anglican Church adapting to the environment it found itself in after 1783. Although the city has been described as anti-Catholic during this era, including by Seton herself, O'Donnell points out that the truth is more complicated. That's your quote, but not, <laughs> not mine. Um, most Protestants of that era had little or no time for members of a religion whose spiritual leader lived and worked in Rome. John Jay, for one, complained that their blind obedience to the Pope caused Catholics to lack independent judgment. But there were many groups in that city debating the right way to worship God and get to heaven, and Catholics were a relatively small blip on the city's religious radar. In any event, since Seton's father had never been violently anti-Catholic, she was not raised to especially hate the Catholic Church. But when Seton was growing up, as Jake alludes to, religion was only one of the many issues that occupied the young woman and her family. Her mother died when she was young, her father married again, apparently a rather unhappy marriage, and there were children from both unions, all of whom needed to be educated, married, or placed in a position that allowed them to earn a living. When she married William Seton, the situation became more complicated because she became at least partially and sometimes fully responsible for members of her husband's blended family. Numerous children, some needing guardianship of some sort, financial difficulties, a husband suffering from tuberculosis that would eventually kill him, and a growing family of her own made for what can perhaps best be described as an interesting life. <laughs> Although Seton was, as O'Donnell notes, a solitary seeker, when it came to religion, her interest in and eventual attraction to John Henry Hobart's style of Episcopalianism allowed her to find fellowship, and, I, and that word is important to me, through New York's Trinity Church, along with others who listened to sermons that, quote, combined a reverence for church structures with the promise of divine imminence and intellectual confidence with a sorrowful awareness of sin. She would enjoy a similar experience of fellowship when following the death of William Seton, she spent time in Italy as a very recent widow with many decisions to make. But her conversion in New York City removed the religious support system she had found with Hobart and Trinity Church. The Catholics she encountered in New York, priests and lay people, were not usually the folks with whom she wanted to associate and develop friendships, spiritual or otherwise. In the end, the saints and sacraments, the Eucharist, and the writings of thinkers and mystics won out over Hobart's brand of spiritual fellowship. When reading Professor O'Donnell's account of Seton's entrance into the Catholic Church, you can't help but think of the stories of other spiritual journeys that eventually led to Catholicism. Even Dorothy Day, who of course was drawn to Catholic social teaching, was also, like Seton, drawn to the beauty of the Mass and, quote, its greatest mystery, the priest's transformation of bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, although Seton at first was not at all sure that any sort of miracle was taking place. And like others whose paths ultimately led to Catholicism, O'Donnell describes well just how complicated Seton's conversion actually was. In addition to her own doubts and spiritual struggles, there were issues related to family and friends, those who supported her decision, such as the Feliki family, and those who advised against it, such as Hobart. Her entrance into the church, the death of her sister-in-law, Rebecca, and the financial concerns she faced as a young widow with the family to raise and no money with which to do it, all made this phase of, phase of her life very complicated. As a Catholic widow with no resources, Finding a means by which she could support herself and her children proved difficult. Teaching was an option, but many suspected that she wanted others, including potential students, to follow her into the Church of Rome. And there indeed may be some justification for their suspicions. For Seton, the ideal scenario was that she would perhaps simplify her life 
by entering the Ursuline convent in Montreal. I'm really not sure why she thought that would simplify her life, but, <laughs> but she did not know all that much about this convent. She had never visited the city. She had never met a nun from that convent. But as Professor O'Donnell writes, the convert, widow, and mother, small m, dreamed of making her way to Montreal and its centuries-old Ursuline convent. Perhaps the nuns might accept her as a lay associate or teacher and her daughters as students. She did not ask for New Yorkers' tolerance. She wanted to make a passionately Catholic life elsewhere. It's one of those ideas that sounded good, I think, to the young widow trying to negotiate a complicated situation, but was in the end impossible to implement. Even those who had encouraged and supported her entrance into the church advised against this move. So instead of leaving New York for the northern city of Montreal, the future saint accepted the suggestion of Father William Dubourg and headed south to Maryland. Instead of entering an existing well-established congregation, Seton would establish, with the support of other men and women, a new religious congregation. The move to Baltimore and eventually Emmitsburg, a move Seton and others believed was both necessary and viable, brought new complicated relationships. Baltimore was a welcome respite from Seton's world in Manhattan. She was delighted to be able to worship at the Sulpician Chapel and to live near St. Mary's Seminary and College. Professor O'Donnell describes the move to Baltimore as going from the city of man to the city of God. And perhaps Seton would have endorsed that phrase because she certainly began to find both the fellowship, back to Hobart, and the spiritual counselor she had been seeking. She also, however, in, entered into even more complicated relationships with several priests and ecclesiastical leaders, including John Carroll, John Dubois, William Dubourg, and Pierre Babad. Although I doubt he believed he was clairvoyant, Carroll considered her a saint. He also referred to her as Wild Betty. And even though he did not necessarily approve of all of her views and decisions, as O'Donnell notes, all of these men were very different from each other. Babad's Baroque spirituality, for instance, did not mesh well with what she describes as Carol's reserved piety, which held that while Catholic tradition was, of course, important, it was necessary and even desirable that the church adapt to a country promoting the closest version of religious freedom that the Western world had experienced. Seton found things to admire about the views of both men, but did not, I think, seem to understand that not everyone was enamored with Babad's views of the church and spirituality, including his Sulpician superiors. After Seton's formal entrance into the Catholic Church, she and Carol became friends of a sort, although they rarely saw each other in person. Carol was, of course, pleased that Seton was willing to establish a congregation of women religious. In order to develop a network of Catholic schools, the bishop needed teachers, preferably sisters, and the contemplative Carmelites who had established a monastery in Port Tobacco, Maryland, were clearly not the answer to his personnel problems. He needed Seton and her Emmitsburg community, and he and his successors would need many more congregations of religious women in the years to come. Despite their friendship and the fact that at times they really had to be mutually dependent on each other, it would be a mistake to say that Carol looked on Seton as an, as an equal. Traditional gender roles clearly come into play in this context. Seton was not included in any of the discussions that occurred between Carol and the Sulpicians, for instance, on the subject of who would determine the final version of the rule of the American Sisters of Charity. Although Seton remained silent on some of these issues, she was willing to voice her opinions and concerns when she believed it was necessary to do so. When William Dubourg, the community's first superior, and the subject of male clerics serving as superiors of communities of women religion is a topic for another seminar, <laughs> um, informed Seton that she and her sisters were not to write to Babad. She took exception to this very first directive that she received as Mother, capital M, Seton. They would simply have to disobey Dubourg's orders, she decided, because if the community was to succeed, Babad had to be involved. Her disobedience apparently did not bother her superior all that much. He proceeded to travel to Emmitsburg to conduct a retreat 
and handed the sisters a preliminary copy of the rules that would govern the new congregation. Seton was definitely a mother according to this document. She, could, she would um, choose readings, review her sister's correspondence, but she was not the sole authority. Duborg and a council of sisters also had a say in the governance and management of the community. Seton seemed to take all this in stride, but decided it was once again necessary to intercede in a dispute that involved the new community and its male superior. There were questions about Babad's role in the spiritual life of the congregation again, and Seton found herself bemoaning the fact that Duborg would not allow him to hear the sisters' confessions. Neither Carol nor Duborg seemed to understand how important this issue was to Mother Seton and her daughters. In the end, Duborg resigned, but Seton was not at all satisfied with his replacement, Father John David. Although she assured Carol she was asking God for the ability to accept David's guidance, either God did not grant her wish or she was unable to comply with the directive. When it became clear that David preferred Sister Rose White to Mother Seton, the one person she could then turn to for practical and spiritual advice was John Carroll. The story stays complicated. The relationships, and in some cases non-relationships, that Seton had with the various male clerics who held some position of authority over the new congregations are indeed complicated, but they are not, as Professor O'Donnell reminds us, unusual. There are issues of gender and power in these stories that even when unpacked do not lend themselves to a simple discussion. And one question, really a couple of related questions, that I'd ask Professor O'Donnell to think about or speculate on, and, I, and I'm asking myself these questions as well, is I wonder when Seton realized what exactly she was getting into when she began to gather that small group of women into the Sisters of Charity of St. Joseph. Did she come to realize that the very men who were grateful for her willingness to educate America's young Catholic women would not take her views into account when developing the rule of the congregation, and that some, like John David, did not really think she or any woman was even capable of managing an organization such as the Sisters of Charity. And one reason I'd like to hear your thoughts on this is that later congregational founders have the opportunity to talk with other founders and male superiors and learn from their advice, experience, and mistakes. But Seton had no such opportunity. Even John David, who Seton believed had not respected her intelligence or judgment, had a congregational model, her model, when he gave up trying to establish a new community that would be united to the Emmitsburg sisters and created a Kentucky sisterhood, the Sisters of Charity of Nazareth. My second question, or set of questions, I guess, concerns Seton within the context of Mother with a capital M. As I said a minute ago, I really don't know when Seton had any idea of what was in store for her when she settled in Emmitsburg. Her spiritual reading and writing, along with running a school and leading the Sisters of Charity, allowed her to refine, quote, her views of life in a community of prayer, service, and worship. But as Professor O'Donnell points out, Seton never enjoyed the luxury of a contemplative cloister. In fact, when finalized, her vision moved her community away from that traditional European model and toward engaging with and in the world. She herself, quote, actively cultivated connection at every turn, and she did so knowing she departed from the central tenet of the monastic tradition. The model Seton developed would be used in one way or another by countless congregations over the next hundred years or so. Despite all of this, I'd like to ask Professor O'Donnell what she thinks about Mother Seton and her search for fellowship during the Emmitsburg years. The role of mother is indeed perhaps the most complicated of all the contextual relationships that Professor O'Donnell develops throughout the book. Seton dies at 47 but spends the last 12 years of her life as a sister of charity. She found peace, at least as much as possible, when worrying about five biological children and a number of spiritual sisters. But did she find fellowship of the kind that Hobart had offered, or that she stumbled upon as a young woman watching her husband die in a strange land? As superior, she was in charge of discipline, and she also had to console, counsel, and support the women who had come to join the congregation. But is that the fellowship she was seeking? 
or was life in a community, even as a superior, all that she really needed. In closing, I'd like to thank Professor O'Donnell for providing us with such a wonderful account of the life and world of Elizabeth Ann Bailey <coughs> Seton, who grew up in New York, married William Seton, became a widow with five young children, converted to Catholicism, and founded the Sisters of, Saint Joseph, of Charity of St. Joseph. She has demonstrated for us that the story of this first American saint is not that simple. It is indeed complicated. Thank you. Uh, the, the strangeness and wonder of this experience <laughs> cannot be overstated. Uh, thank you so much for reading the book, for, for commenting on the book. Um, and I am much happier to listen to, to you talk about the book uh, than to once more listen to me uh, ponder the book. Uh, but we have kind of great uh, questions in front of us, so I'll just quickly throw out um, some answers, although really the, the book is in the world now. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm really in charge anymore. Um, and then I look forward after the, the break to hearing you. Uh, so the question of, um, and I'm, I'm particularly grateful, I should say, that uh, the, the question of the usefulness and the meaning of biography is foregrounded by both of the commenters. Um, and the nature of relationships, uh, because this did feel like a book about relationships. Um, and even her institutional uh, creations emerged from relation. Um, so I'm grateful that we have set off on that path. The challenge of representing a, a person of faith historically was one that I struggled with. Um, anxiously, and I'll kind of combine that with the questions of audience and sources. I, the first time I went to uh, the archive at Emmitsburg, of course, was going to let me in on Monday, but I got there on Sunday, as one does, and, and drove over, and of course there was a mass going on, uh, because the basilica is right next to the archive. And I was struck in that moment very profoundly by what I was going to try to do, which was to write a scholarly biography um, of a, a woman who is a, a living spiritual presence. So I was going to use my kind of technical skills um, to reconstruct a past um, in which other people used a different kind of faith and memory to bring that past into the present. I almost turned around and left. Um, the, the kind of arrogance of the project overwhelmed me in that moment. Um, uh, but uh, there were great sources, right? Uh, so, <laughs> and I had used travel funds. Um, so, uh, so I sort of burrowed into the sources, um, and that was the touchstone that I returned to throughout the, throughout the project. Um, she explained her transitions, her doubts. She put it on paper to a great extent. Other people did also. Um, and of course, I had to track down references. I had to seek advice. Um, but uh, Seton's experience as a person of faith was in the sources. So I felt that as an historian, I could approach this aspect of human life, which is so difficult to describe and discuss. Um, I did, and I've confessed, this, confessed uh, this before, kind of bracket what a friend of mine called the God bits. As I was writing, I was much more comfortable kind of looking at censuses and so forth. But of course, faith makes things happen in Seton's life. Faith is the driver. Faith is the animator. So it was ridiculous to, 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 to bracket that. Um, but, but it was something that I continue to think about, and I'm, I'm interested to, to hear what, people, what people's responses are. Sources absolutely are wonderful, and they are absolutely curated, right? Um, and so uh, saint making is archive making in a wonderful way. That's, that's why there's so much evidence. Saint making is also storytelling. Um, and Seton had read those stories. And you see Seton shaping her own experience sometimes as she's, as she's having it in this template. Um, of, 
martyrdom or suffering or achievement. And of course, then when you overlay that with a kind of you know, much later 19th century Catholic immigrant experience, up from nothing, right? Um, uh, combating prejudice, it's a kind of ethnic, social, economic martyrdom then that, that overlays that Catholic story. And there's a certain amount of reading through that that, that has to happen, which I, which I tried to do, but I, and I'm also interested to hear other people's reactions. Um, she was absolutely aware that she was thought of as important to the church. This is why she wanted to burn her papers. Uh, she did not, her life was complicated. <laughs> she knew it was complicated. Um, she did not burn them. Dear Remembrances is, is a way, I, a, a document she created, if you, if you recall that, from the mm -hmm. book, which I think was in a way supposed to be a kind of stepping stone through the rapids um, of that era and the, the changes. It, it's not invented in any way, but it's, it's highly curated. It guides you to a particular understanding. Um, and that was then, no sources are transparent. That was particularly not a transparent source, yet it does tell us something about how she understood her life and her obligation kind of to, to, to be this representation. Um, just really, uh, really quickly, um, yes, Seton's social position is absolutely crucial. And I loved uh, the, the way Jake put it, that she never lost her social capital, even when she lost her money. Um, and the Sulpicians, right, these emigre priests, see this immediately. They, they are remarkably good at seeing what will work, what will be advantageous in this setting in which they find themselves. And she, as a genteel matron, um, is clearly uh, an acceptable public face of Catholicism. Um, of course, underneath, right, she's single-minded and prickly and roiling with all kinds of questions, uh, but, but the face that she presents to the world is one of gentility, which, and money was absolutely essential to that. Uh, she kind of went from one network, the transatlantic merchant network, to another network, right, when she entered the Catholic Church, and the, the Feliki are the the overlaps. Um, OK, can I just say that's not my subtitle, American Sane? <laughs> um, uh, yes, uh, the, the, the press, bless their hearts, um, uh, <laughs> was, was adamant. So Catherine, what do you think of the subtitle American Saint? And whatever you think, that's the subtitle. And um, I, I understand that. It, it, is, it is catchy. It is, it is also reductive and, and somewhat, I think, sets us in a different direction. Seton, her nationalism was not central to Seton's conception of herself in any way. Um, not in any way. And in fact, the Atlantic framework, I think, is supremely useful, right down to the fact that the Daughters of Charity model um, is remarkably well-suited uh, with adaptation to this growing early Republic American model. So I'll just sort of touch on that, and I, I hope other people discuss it. Um, and then just uh, qu quickly, because these are such rich questions. Um, I see, right, I see Seton as a natural contemplative who, who is drawn into this world of benevolence and, and bustle. Um, and that was always a challenge for her, I think. And I think at the, the part of her humility uh, came from the fact that she realized that she had moved heaven and earth, uh, to achieve a life to which she was perhaps not particularly well suited, <laughs> or at least on the, on the surface, right? She and Cecilia O'Conway were sick from the old sickness, mm -hmm. uh, which is this desire to, uh, to have a room of one's own, <laughs> I suppose, to use a, a slightly different uh, model, um, and to, to be contemplatives. Um, she did, she certainly found some fellowship with sisters in different ways, with Margaret George, with Cecilia O'Conway, with Brute. Um, but I think that there was, uh, there is a melancholy, uh, there, there is a, a, a striving uh, that, that never goes away. And I think that sense of her own 
frailty, vulnerability, slight, slight miscasting, which of course goes back to her childhood when she felt out of place in her own home, um, really uh, is, is part of the root of this gentleness that you see growing later in her life that comes to be the companion of this real ruthlessness uh, that, that is, that is all, also a, par a party to that. Um, and certainly her sense of the constraints of gender is there throughout her life, right? This is a woman who has a good education, uh, who works silently as a clerk for her husband <laughs> without being acknowledged, um, who uh, could perfectly well support herself had the gender constraints been removed after she was a widow, um, and who found the gendered architecture of the church both gave her an extraordinary uh, possibility, which was to live a life as a, as a sister, which she would not have had outside that church, um, but which also constrained her expressiveness, her ability to, to govern some of her own actions. It's, it's not only a gendered ar architecture, it's a, it's a theological architecture, of course, which also values obedience. Um, but she never kind of stopped thinking about these things, in a, it, again, in a way which I find uh, moving, um, e even when she expressed them only in these odd sort of bursts, <laughs> sort of that, that came out in letters, that sort of questioning that uh, she, did not, she did not do publicly. But again, I hope that these are questions that I would love to hear other people uh, discuss and ruminate about. And again, I just I can't thank the commenters enough for their thoughtful and generous presentations. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to Jake. Uh, you certainly distinguished yourself well. And that's exactly why we invited you to speak, because you're not a historian of American religion. I think this book is so speaks to so many different historiographies. And thank you for helping us situate it in that. And, and Maggie, I actually forgot to mention that, that Maggie um, uh, most recently won a travel grant um, from the Kushwa Center to support her work on a new biography of Catherine Drexel. So uh, also another complicated story. So I heard in your comments, um, I, I, I heard some shades of what you're grappling with. So clearly we're going to have a wonderful discussion. Uh, we will now just take a very quick 10-minute uh, break to refresh coffee, and um, we'll reconvene here in about 10 minutes and open the conversation. So thank you very much to Jake and Maggie for starting us off.